I really love when my readers and viewers ask me questions, and I especially love answering them, particularly when I don't immediately know the answer. In the process of searching for that answer, I not only learn more about physics myself, but often find topics for new videos. Recently, a friend asked how a smartphone's touchscreen works. Specifically, how our phone knows which part of its screen we're touching, and how. So, I thought this would be a great topic for a video, as there are many technologies for creating touchscreens, each of which allows us to revisit different physical phenomena and marvel at the ingenuity of engineers who find non-trivial practical applications for these phenomena. One of the first touch-responsive screens was the so-called resistive touchscreen. In these, the actual screen was located beneath a sensor panel consisting of two plates made of a transparent conductive material such as indium tin oxide. The top panel needed to be flexible, so it was made from plastic. Small dielectric bumps were placed between the plates to maintain the distance between them. When you press on the screen, you push the top flexible plate into contact with the bottom plate at the point of touch, closing the circuit. If voltage is then applied to both plates, electric current will flow through them. The current's magnitude will depend on the circuit's resistance which in turn depends on the length of the path the current must travel. The further the point of touch is from the power source, the longer the path the current travels through the material, resulting in higher resistance and lower current for the same voltage. By measuring the current flowing through the circuit at a known voltage, you can determine where on the screen the touch occurred. There are various implementations of this technology, such as matrix, four wire, 5-wire and 8-wire touchscreens, but the differences lie more in circuitry than in physics. The physical principles remain the same. Mechanical closure of a circuit made of two conductive layers and calculation of resistance based on the current flow. Resistive screens are simple, cheap to manufacture, and reliable, but they have several drawbacks. Firstly, to function, at least the top layer of the screen must be made of flexible plastic, which has poorer optical properties than glass, resulting in a less sharp image. Additionally, plastic scratches easily, further degrading the image quality. Moreover, due to the mechanical operation of the screen, if the pressure is insufficient, the sensor may not respond. Anyone who has used an ATM or similar device knows how frustrating this can be. Finally, like all devices with moving mechanical parts, Resistive screens have a limited lifespan and can handle about 30 million touches. Another type of touch screen is the capacitive screen, which actually comprises two fundamentally different technologies, surface capacitive and projected capacitive screens. Surface capacitive screens, in my opinion, are more similar to resistive screens than projected capacitive screens. A surface capacitive screen also consists of a conductive layer to which identical electric potential is applied from four electrodes placed at different corners of the screen. Since the electric potential at all electrodes is the same, no current flows through the screen. However, if we touch the screen with a conductive object that is grounded, i.e. has zero potential, electric current will flow through the contact point and the object, resulting in current within the screen itself. The current magnitude from each electrode to the touch point will depend on the distance between the electrode and the touch point, much like in a resistive screen. Since the human body conducts electricity, touching the screen with a finger or another body part will also work. However, without grounding or with poor grounding, the screen may malfunction. Over time, the electric potential of the body touching the screen will equalize with the screen's potential and current will no longer flow. Therefore, modern devices apply alternating voltage to the electrodes. In this case, current will flow back and forth through the conductive object, touching the screen indefinitely, similar to how alternating current flows in a circuit containing a capacitor that continuously charges and discharges as the alternating voltage changes. Yes, you understood correctly. Every time you touch such a screen, you are slightly electrocuted. However, since the screen voltage is low, around five volts, and the human body's resistance is significant, the current magnitude will be negligible and you won't feel it. Surface capacitive screen components are not subject to mechanical deformation. 
so such devices do not require a minimum force to operate and have a longer lifespan. However, their weak point is the conductive layer on the screen, which can be damaged. Nevertheless, considering all factors, the lifespan of surface capacitive screens is about 10 times longer than that of resistive screens, although they are somewhat more expensive. They also provide better image quality since glass, with its superior optical properties, can be used as the substrate for the conductive layer. And there are fewer layers in a surface capacitive display. On the other hand, resistive screens are more resistant to external conditions, making them more suitable for outdoor devices. A problem with using surface capacitive screens is that they will only respond to conductive objects. For example, they will ignore a hand in a glove unless it's a special glove with conductive fibers woven into the material. Another significant drawback of surface capacitive screens is that they do not support multi-touch functionality, which limits their use in devices like smartphones. This capability is provided by another technology with a similar name, but a fundamentally different operating principle the so-called projected capacitive screens, which almost all modern smartphone touchscreens use. A projected capacitive screen is divided into many points, like sensor pixels, each consisting of a pair of transparent conductors separated by a layer of transparent dielectric, making the entire sensor pixel a tiny transparent capacitor. We have a separate video about capacitors, so if you're not very familiar with how these devices work, you might want to watch it before continuing. Just in case, I'll cover the main features of capacitors that concern us. When a capacitor is connected to a direct current circuit, the electric field of the circuit pulls electrons from one of its plates and pushes them into the other, resulting in a positive charge on the first plate and a negative charge on the second. As the capacitor charges, an internal electric field forms in the plates. In the positive plate, it attracts electrons, opposing the field of the circuit from extracting them from the plate, while in the negative plate, it repels electrons, opposing the field of the circuit from inserting electrons into the plate. In other words, the internal fields of the plates hinder the capacitor's charging, and the stronger the charge, the stronger the opposition. Eventually, this internal field becomes as strong as the circuit field and charging stops. We say the capacitor is fully charged to the value maximally possible at this external voltage. The amount of charge a capacitor can accumulate at a given voltage is equal to the product of this voltage and the capacitor's inherent characteristic known as its capacitance. Now let's see what happens in a charged capacitor when a conductive object is brought near it. Since the object conducts electricity, it contains charge carriers that can move freely within the substance. If we bring our object close to the positively charged capacitor plate, its internal field will attract negative charge carriers and repel positive ones, causing them to redistribute within the conductive object in some manner. But just as the charges in the plate create a field that affects the charges in the conductor, the field of the charges in the conductor also affects the charges in the plate. Specifically, in our case, the negative charge carriers in the conductor will repel the electrons in the plate, and the positive charge carriers will attract them. However, since the charge carriers in the conductor have redistributed under the influence of the plate's field, the repulsion will be weaker than the attraction, meaning that after bringing the conductor close to the plate, an additional external third field appears in the system. This field will be directed opposite to the internal field of the plate and in the same direction as the field of the circuit, aiding the circuit's field in charging the capacitor. As a result, the capacitor can charge more at the same voltage, which means it will have a higher capacitance. So, the capacitance of the capacitor in our sensor pixel increases if a conductive object, such as our finger, is near it. By detecting that the capacitance of this particular capacitor has increased, we can determine that something has been brought close to it. The coolest part is that the capacitance of the capacitor changes differently depending on how close the conductor is to it. As a result, bringing a conductive object near an array of capacitors, i.e. our touchscreen, will affect several capacitors simultaneously but differently. By analyzing how the capacitance of each capacitor has changed, 
we can fairly accurately determine where and at what distance from the screen our object is located. Thus, a projected capacitive display consists of many transparent capacitors made from the same indium tin oxide arranged in a two-dimensional array. In reality, this array looks like this, allowing for more uniform coverage of the main screen surface with the conductive material and avoiding disruption of the image uniformity. In cross-section, it looks like this, differing from the neat array of capacitors we drew earlier, but it turns out that in practice, this scheme works better, even from an electrical point of view. Projected capacitive screens outperform the aforementioned technologies in almost every aspect. The technology involves neither mechanical deformations nor direct contact with a conductive surface, ensuring an almost unlimited lifespan for the sensor panel. Additionally, such screens support multi-touch and gesture recognition, and can even respond to the pressure of touch. Like surface capacitive screens, they only respond to conductive objects, but their capabilities are broader. Direct electrical contact is not required, so this screen will respond, for example, to a finger touch in a medical glove. The main drawback is the relatively high cost of such screens, but it is worth it, and this is why the vast majority of modern smartphones are equipped with touchscreens made using this technology. However, there are alternative ways to organize touchscreens, one of which is the so-called infrared grid technology. Here, it is very simple. An infrared grid is placed parallel to the screen with sensors on the opposite sides. The fact of touching the screen is determined by the disappearance of the signal in one or more sensors, and by determining which ones, we can find out exactly where the screen was touched. The advantages of this technology are simplicity, low cost, and repairability. A damaged emitter or sensor is easily replaceable, whereas a projected capacitive screen must be replaced entirely. There are no additional material layers over the main screen, ensuring better image quality. Furthermore, these touchscreens will respond to any opaque object. This last advantage is also a drawback, since such screens will respond to dust and debris, making them mainly suitable for indoor use. Additionally, infrared touchscreens do not support multi-touch and gesture recognition, so they are often used in televisions and similar large screen systems where image quality is important, and creating a projected capacitive panel of the corresponding size would be prohibitively expensive. Another method using infrared light is employed in the so-called touch screens based on the principle of frustrating total internal reflection. This method is based on a phenomenon from linear optics where electromagnetic radiation hitting the boundary of media with higher and lower optical densities at a certain angle of incidence refuses to enter the less dense medium and is completely reflected back into the denser medium. However, if an object with an optical density closer to that of the initial medium is placed at the point of incidence, total internal reflection will be frustrated. This effect can be used to create another type of touch screen. A transparent screen is placed in front of the display, illuminated from the sides by an infrared radiation source, directed such that the emitted rays undergo total internal reflection within the screen. Tiny photo elements are placed behind the screen, signaling if infrared radiation hits them. Normally, the detectors remain silent because all the light stays inside the material. However, if we place a hand or another object on the screen, it will frustrate total internal reflection at that point, and the light will reach the detector. Theoretically, infrared screens based on disrupting total internal reflection can do everything that projected capacitive screens can, but better. The only area where they fall short is in the slightly lower accuracy of determining the touch point, making this technology not very suitable for mobile phones. However, its relative affordability allows for the production of large touch screens. This technology, for example, is used in Microsoft PixelSense touch tables and can potentially be used for creating digital blackboards and similar applications in the future. There are other touch screen technologies such as screens based on surface acoustic waves, screens using the piezoelectric effect, and so on. However, most of these devices have significant drawbacks that likely prevent them from successfully competing with the technologies mentioned above. So we will stop here for today. 
Goodbye, dear friends, and see you next time.